the song playing we can't hear it all right so the Sorry. song is going to play here in a minute and i'm actually going to get it right this time welcome everybody to the roughneck to real estate podcast we are live on facebook with our buddy dave heil and our host Corey thompson the motherfucker <laughs> of mobile homes here's our theme song he's the motherfucker of mobile homes he's the motherfucker There it is, everybody. Welcome to the show. We've got Corey and Dave. They are going to take it away for you. What's up, Dave? Hey, how are you doing? Thanks for bringing Where you me at in. These? Where you at today? Minnesota? Yep, back home in Minnesota, uh, doing a few rounds over here. We took over a couple of sites in the last 30 days, so we've been kind of uh, making some uh, rehab plans, You know, lining up some contractors. We're laying some concrete before the... Uh, uh, the winter chill comes in. We got about two more weeks before it freezes up, before you got to lay blankets down and get creative with getting concrete and everything ready. We do a lot of building in the winter. Uh, we employ a lot of people to uh, do construction in the winter because it slows down and you get a better rate. And you're talking like that low price per square foot. That's wow. where we really knock out a couple extra buildings in the winter and keep people working. Dude, tell everybody what you do. A lot of people know you. A lot of people don't. Introduce yourself like... Let them know. Uh, let them know what you got going on. Yeah, I got to put this thing on. Um, uh, looks like do not disturb. One second. Oh, you were getting a call. Yeah. Okay, I got it now. So, so got... introduce yourself. Let 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 the people know what you do. I know you do self storage. Tell tell everybody a little bit about how you got there. Uh, back in 2015, I was sitting in my cubicle at Honeywell. I did uh, combustion design for. Um, uh, like the homes automation group. So we would de design uh, air fuel linkage for natural grass uh, appliances and like the water heaters, the uh, furnaces. I I'd work on that stuff every, uh, all day and I'd, I'd travel around the country and do safety design. And we would inspect if there'd be like a, you ever seen a house blow up with natural gas? I would go in there and, and I would inspect to make sure it wasn't our device. And I'm a really highly technical, like electronics, uh, mechanical and numbers guy, you know, so I'd be crunching spreadsheets all the time. And a buddy of mine um, that lived in my basement back in 2012 or 13, he, um, his dad passed away early and he, he, um, he had like six or 700,000 that he deployed into real estate, made a bunch of bad moves, a couple of good moves. And um, he was pretty tight for capital um, around 13, 14. So he lived in my basement. So we, we kind of, you know, shot the shit a lot. And we, um, you know, took stories back and forth. I used to flip cars and get super creative with making income. Cause I just, you know, I always wanted to make more money. I knew there was more to be made, but I didn't have the access or the tools to do it. So him and I would shoot his own place, went to Arizona for a while, kind of, you know, dance around. He's a, he's a serial entrepreneur. He owned a smoke shop too, but he came back to Wisconsin and he did a storage deal that was foreclosed. And I mean, 8% of self-storage deals for closed because they're, they're pretty easy to operate in any um, economical environment. Uh, but he found one where a guy was, you know, he had a, a, a back injury from marathon running and uh, he was addicted to some painkillers, divorced recently and just lost a lot of the compassion to run this site like he should. So he brought me into the deal after me, I got, I said, you know, what is the equity position that your partner's in? And it was 20%. And I did the cash and cash figures that if, even if I doubled the guy's money and came in there, he, the guy paid like 50, 60,000. I was going to come at 120. I'd netting like 20 to 30% with no leverage on my equity buy-in. So for me, I knew that interest rates being a percent or, you know, so in a, in a savings account in 2015, it made sense, right? I'm an engineer. I'm a numbers guy. I'm going back to my cube and I'm like, you know, 20%, like this, this is pretty good, right? Well, that was, that was the first taste of, you know, what real estate can do for you. I had no idea 
about leverage whatsoever. Every car I bought that I flipped, I flipped over 60 cars uh, from college years, uh, right out of high school to college years. I paid for my college that way. Flip cars, the put in like the remote car starters. You guys don't have, have it in Texas, but in in Minnesota, we have these car starters where you start your car and it's cold out. It runs yeah. for 20 minutes and whatever. It's, it's warm when you get happy tax. I didn't understand, you know, tax returns or anything. But I went to school to be an engineer, so I thought that was the holy grail, right? I'm going to make 130000 I'm going to put away all this cash, and I'm going to save it. I'm going to have a 401k. Well, none of that shit was stacking. <laughs> I was doing it for 10 years, you know? And, you know, I kept playing the, the car hustle game. I bought a couple of houses with the uh, the money that I had coming in from my W-2, and it was just enough to get by, right? Because um, right. it was right where the uh, the economy for the last 10 years, there was no economic growth in in wages, right? So wages went up maybe 1% to 2% a year, and for three of the five years that my last years in engineering, they said, we don't, we don't have a raise for you because the economy is too tight. There's all this fear. So there was a lot of fear that in the corporate environment that they always sold you that kept you nestled in you're like well it's it's fearful out there you know there's there's a lot of shit moving on and if honeywell's not doing well no one else is right so they bring in this mass economic scale that makes you want to sit in that cube and rot right and and i knew i had more capacity but i didn't know how to use it so my first deal i didn't even have all the capital all i had was um at the time was to re-leverage a couple of the assets that i had already a couple of cars I think you guys see me post a few times. I bought uh, a couple of fan cool 911s, which yep. are the only cars that ever made me more than 10 grand per rip. I'd usually make five to 10 grand, but I wouldn't include my labor, right? A, a real profit lot statement has human labor in it, right? I would say, yeah, I made 10 grand on this car. Well, that's my labor. And, you know, right. it's, refund, so it's refunded to you. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cash refund of your labor that you did to restore the vehicle. But I still hold on both of those cars today. And I... Um, I think I have a note on one of them for eighty-five thousand because they they appraised one appraisal is like one forty and the other one's like a hundred, and I can run two and three percent loans on those and and dump it back into real estate and make fifteen to twenty bare minimum right, right. behind leverage on real estate, and then I started you know using all these little tools and putting the pieces together, and I just started building this rocket ship of of like how to acquire, how to rehab, how to market, how to build the right mindset of team because a lot of people. People see me, um, um, you know, like they call it bragging. They call it like the elitist mindset where they're like, oh, this guy's, why doesn't he just shut his shit down? You know, like (laughs) he doesn't need to be telling everybody he's that good. Well, if you don't do that, you end up with people in your social circle that don't resemble the type of performance that you get a rush off of. So then you end up with phone calls on Monday mornings saying that, you know, I don't feel good. Like, oh, last night, this girl, she just... She didn't get me. I was drunk, you know, like the regular shit, like the conversations that just suck all the energy out of the next move and the next move that you would have had planned, but you just gave up. So I guess to go back to the beginning, it all started with one cash on cash move is like, all right, money in. All right, this is my return. How can I multiply it? How can I maximize it? Or how can I sharpen the iron, right? Didn't you didn't you buy him out for a million dollars? Didn't you go leverage that property and send yeah. him away for a million? So the fir- yeah, the first deal, he had a 20-year AM on it and five and a quarter percent. And to me, I thought, man, that's that's really good rates. So that's really good interest and all that shit. And then the more and more I dug into it and I started going locally for banks, credit unions and community banks, I realized that, that you know, nonprofit banks, they can they're allowed to lend money at a less split, right? Because they just got to get their depositors paid. So I searched like five or six banks and um, I use a, a local credit union. It's Wings Credit Union. I mean, you could call the guy. He's super He's super tight. So, I mean, I can't guarantee anybody's going to get a loan or worry about competition right, right. or muddy in the water because you just, everything has to be in alignment with, do you have any DUIs? Do you do speed? Did you do all this? For a credit union, their biggest thing is risk. You know, they do a risk analysis on you and I fit everything to a T because I had a W-2 I did have a DUI back in 2006, but nothing since. You know, I learned my lesson, and that's what they want to see. But I had a Porsche that I didn't have a loan on the time, and I said I could take a loan against this asset because I have an appraisal. So I was starting to learn these things, and I also had my house, which I just pulled an appraisal on and showed equity there. So I started to just first get the taste of a personal financial statement, how to show on paper that you're worth close to you know 500,000 or whatever it is at the time. Now remember, your net worth is contingent on 
um, global economy sometimes because your house could be the the equity can be eroded by a few interest points, right? Where oh, now yeah. it's not in the affordability of someone else. So I bought a house that was in a marketplace that it's a it's it's worth seven hundred fifty thousand today, but I bought it out of foreclosure for. 399 because I knew I could sweat equity it and get it up there just like I'd used to do with the cars. So it's, I was never afraid to work. And I think that's why the equation worked out faster for me because that be, I was not ever afraid to like change a toilet, right. Or right. to paint a car or to change brake pads. And, and all that to me was a challenge more or less. And I said to myself is that if I can get my first hundred clients, then I can do my first 300 and 500. And then once I'm backed into a corner, I'll, I'll start bringing in people behind me. Because a lot of people do it wrong and they bring in everybody in the front end and then you're not proving tax returns, right? And that's right. really all the banks care about, right? They're like, I want to get their interest and they want to make sure that their principal is safe. Well, see, in our first conversation, it, it basically went just like this. And you started explaining some things about banking, banking to me and I brought it back to our partners and I said, hey, look, this is what this guy that I just got off the phone with just told me. And they're like, where did you meet him? I'm like, on a Grant Cardone thread. <laughs> like in the live comments on the section on the live feed on, on Grant Cardone, they're like, all right, so you're taking your face out of the comments section. I'm like, well, yeah, but, I, but I'm watching what he's doing and it makes sense to me. We need to pull this equity out. We don't need to leave it in. We need to go get loans and we need to take equity and we need to put it in the bank and rat hole that shit. So whenever we go for our big loans, we've got money in the bank. Absolutely. And Proof of funds are, ev are everything in the beginning. As you prove your PFS, and, and you have no, more net worth, they understand that you be, might be highly aggressively acquiring, right? But now you can show recent down payments and you can show your track history, right? You can say, you're, you can show your recent appraisals, which is hard money on the books, right? Where you're like, this oh, yeah. is what this net operating is, was, but it was 40,000, now it's 80,000. You know, I just created a half million of equity or whatever the cap rate is in the area where that's real stabilized equity, right? That's their, that's their passive flow from you as the entrepreneur giving back to the bank and then the bank paying the real estate and then giving the rest of the depositors. So it's a trickle down effect, right? And a lot of so, people were never explained this theory or, or, the, or the way to approach it, to put it into work. So they just sit there in fear, right? You see that Sears went out of business. The guy is like, what did they own? They didn't make a $146 million payment, right? But they made profit for decades, right? So was that really a failed venture? You know, I mean, oh, no, not at all. They, like, they employed how many hundreds or thousands of people for decades and created a new environment for appliances and, and everything to be excelled. That was, that's a successful venture, you know? I mean, yeah, it was phased out by, by technology, but to be honest, that's what everybody sells is all this fear with leverage and no one ever gets to build their back office because of it is that they get stuck there saying, oh, I shouldn't take a loan out. Everybody tells me I shouldn't take a loan out for it. How are you going to compete in an environment where every corporation has – stabilize debt but you don't how right. are you going to do it how, so how so, are you going to how are you going to compete with the guy beside you that has storage i mean we'll go into a story that i just took over a guy that he had so much fear um after you ask a few more questions it's a perfect example on a fast repay kind of i got to get this this debt knocked out mindset right so go ahead with with your stuff and i'll, I'll kind of end with that well, story it's a good one you know we went we went from 30 rentals from the from the phone conversation i had with you in what march to now we're sitting at 190. We'll close on 100 in the next month. 100 oh, yeah. doors in the next month. It's because, exponential because at that point. Once you, once you compound it, it's like okay. And then so I'm riding with this with Rome, and he's from he's from Portland, Oregon. And he's like, what's what's your biggest holdback? Is it money? I said, no, it's not capital. I said, mm -hmm. I said we're outrunning capital. We got capital. Right now we got to build our back office. We got to build mm -hmm. systems. Like all the stuff we left behind that we're like, oh man, you know we missed this person. We need to evict them. So we've got to get somebody that's paying attention to that. Like we're paying yep. attention to it, but still we've got stuff falling through the cracks. So I go to a meeting today. That's where I was at two o'clock today. I met with our third bank in the line, basically wrote out a, a roadmap and, he, and we got approved for 2 million a day, um, which is our third bank. So we've got a really good middle bank. We've got our private money that we buy it with. We yep, get yep. all of our CapEx expenditures out of the way. We, we got our aggressive bank that takes us out of that loan. Now we got our mm -hmm. third bank in line that takes out the, the small bank. And I mean, we are set up now. Like we, everybody like gets now, their cut, like, and there's and there's no reason not to have these different lines in because you need the aggressive, and then you need the the very end bank, the terminating bank, where you're like, hey, this is my hold strategy. And a lot of people, they they'll never learn that because they'll go in one move and then they'll sell it, and then they'll be they'll like Grant said, you got a fucking million dollars in the bank, now what, right? right. 
Well, you pay taxes on it. Like yeah, you got a yeah. taxable event on your hands. One, yep, so yep. You, you've got six. You, you got four hundred thousand due at some point next year. It's like when we went and talked to the bank. The bank's like, "Why don't you sell something or sell this?" I was like, "Well, I'd rather borrow money against it." You know, and he's like, "Well, okay. So what did that take?" Absolutely. So took a personal guarantor. So what did we start? You know, we called up some people. Said, "Hey, we need a personal guarantor." They come in, and it's like if we can get this first deal out of the way, if we can pull this first batch of equity, if we can get half a million in the bank, we're set. You know what I mean? So. Mm-hmm went and did it I, and and you know it's it's a plan that we mapped out on the phone and like it's probably people that are watching this right now are going oh shit what are they saying you know what i mean they're having to google they're having to they're having to catch up yeah. but yeah. yeah that that was what that first phone call was like with you and so when i put it into you know my little brain and started figuring it out i'm like this is this is right like this is right we don't need to sit with that equity um on our books we need to well a million and a million in equity on your books is is really only gaining you about 80,000 in flow, rough numbers on an eight cap, right? right? About 80 right. grand. So if you take out a half million and, 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 you, and you take down your flow, let's say if it's 70% LTV or something like that, you pull out um, you know, 500,000, right? Um, now you're really only giving up 40,000 of flow to go redeploy 500. You've never touched at that point 500 grand before in your life, right? And, right. Now, and, now, and now you go into, some contract for deed deals, some creative financing, and a few of your um, of your other flips that you did, and you turn that 500 into a million, right? So you're you're paying a holding cost in that 500,000, which is chewing away at it at only what five to eight percent or whatever your capital cost was right. at that point. But you're running with it now. That's what a lot of people don't understand is that these tax codes that you can leverage off your property and it's not taxable is because it makes you run. It makes you run, right? Oh yeah. That and that and that's why. If that deed ever crosses hands, then the, the government's like, all right, where's my cut, right? So if you can find good assets that can stay with you for decades, that's your stability because now you've just put on your books equity. You rebalance the balance sheet, put some back in cash. You covered your ass if you have, like you said, an eviction problem or a bad manager or an embezzlement because this shit happens. It's going to happen. You're going to go through bad managers. You're going to build your, you're, it's gonna build your elite team in it, and it's going to take your entire life. And it's fine, right. you know. It's and, it's there's no end goal. And so yeah, no, no, because it's like it's like somebody always asks me, when are you gonna stop? I'm like, yeah, I don't, man. I'm I in know. love with the process. I'm so in love yeah. with the process. I could literally do this every day. Like I love the time I spend with my daughter. I love what we get to go do. But yep. I'm also in love with the process. Like I'm in, I'm in love with um, getting the analyzed deals. You know, we're taking down a deal in a town of 4,500 people, and this is the craziest deal we're gonna do um, in a long time. I'll be talking about it forever. Um, we're buying it for 250 thousand. It needs about 300,000 in updates and stuff. The city's gonna write the check for 300,000. They wow. hand this to contractors and said, here, pick one. And it's like a clean pass through right back in their economy because it's what you always say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stands, you know what I mean? Yeah, so we yeah. have to come in from out of town and, and we're, not, we're not somebody's cousin, we're not an uncle. They're not handing it to their brother-in-law, but it's mm-hmm. going to the brother-in-law. It's just passing through us, you know what I mean? So just, just, talking that deal and sitting down with the city and saying, this is our plan. And they, they, they like, Hey, we got an economic development corporation. Here's a card, go talk to them. They hand us a list of contractors. I'll be out there all weekend getting their bids. And, and we're going to get a property that gross rents are going to be $19,400 and we're going to have $250,000 in it. You know what I mean? Damn right. Yeah. And then, and and then, that's, we'll and then you'll probably and, end up with, um, you know, your tax base will be on real estate will be very low for a long time because right. you because your entry point, that's, a lot of people don't understand too is your entry point when when we buy we buy for upside right so your entry point is the last recorded sale and your real estate tax is going to be linked to that and an average of the you know the other uh, price per square foot in the area so you're going to kill it for a long time before anybody is really going to catch up with inflation and property tax you know oh yeah so it's right. it's great for you it's great for the um, economy and it's great for that little community you know right and and one of the deals they made us make was we gotta we gotta let a police officer move in and i'm like well that's a no-brainer you know what i mean no brainer like, that is, that's that is, a no-brainer yeah. like i mean i, I invite them home? like yeah. yeah that's a no-brainer like what no no problem he's got i he's do that got, with um with the local security I, I try to do that with every storage facility i i, I do offer that because they do some of remote uh surveillance on public ips on our cameras and we'll get a, a local police guy you know to come in there and have his shit there because come in do the rounds you know, turn your right. little light on, and and then uh, it's, it's just more secure. So yeah, it's a home run, man. That's that's good, good Dude, move. And 
and this is all stuff that we learned or, or I learned from a from a conversation with you and then you know how you found Jamie you found Jamie in the in the comment section of yeah. Grant Cardone post too you know what I mean I don't know if Grant Cardone knows how many people he's fucking influencing just from people talking shit on his live oh yeah you know what I mean? yeah, yeah. Like, it's like yep. my, my t I look at all my network, all the people that are moving and shaking, and I met them through Grant Cardone, and I've never even met Grant Cardone. <laughs> so oh, it's I like, mean, it's yeah, it's it, yeah, no doubt. And he maps it out perfectly. Like the the science is there. The only thing people are missing is the action to um, to really dig and to do cold calls and to knock on doors that just do it doesn't look right. It doesn't look like someone is taking care of it because every day someone's getting older, you know, and they're and they're getting less and less enthused to work on their property. Every right. piece of real estate is owned by somebody, you know, either that or the, it's in a tax collector's hand, right? Or something, right. Oh, no. yep. but, and that's a lot of people are missing that is that they're, they're only looking on market. It's like the tools are out there and you're not going to be able to retain the knowledge until you deploy it. And if you don't deploy it, it's just going to come, it's going to like fleet through your hands like sand because you can only learn so much without practical use of it. And that's why it's like, I, I preach to people, I'm like, read a book, understand some of it, but after that, get on the streets and practice it. You've got to go do it. Like, I mean, yeah. a guy, a guy made a comment today. He's like, I don't want to lose all my money. I'm like, well, you're not going to lose it all in real estate. It doesn't go to zero. You know what I mean? Yeah. You might yeah. lose some of it, but there's people yeah. that pay for that education. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? There's people that pay a guru 40 grand, come out and lose 40 grand and they're 80 in, you know what I mean? You can skip oh, the yeah. into the guru stuff. You can just oh, definitely, it, definitely. go take yeah. action. So yep. tell, tell us a little bit about the, I, I see you're, you're, you got a really good partner in Cleveland you know, breaking mm -hmm. down, like yep. break down some of that. What what do you expect from that build? Like once that thing, how long does it take from a uh, vacant lot to I'm at 85% capacity? Like what have you been seeing in that? Because we're all kind of new at mm -hmm. this. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we've only got, I've only got four years or, you know, three and a half, four years into it. And remember my first deal in 2015 in March, I was so new because I like, I owned what, 10% of my own equity in a $3 million site, right? I was just basically brushing the surface on it. But now we're getting a lot smarter on how to find holes in the market. So like in a Cleveland deal, uh, now I've done uh, four or five ground up. Hey, this was farmland. I zoned it, permit, you know, right. I put a culvert, I put a drive, I put an address, a mailbox, you know, you know, all the, all the, all the, the functionality of it until you go to CO, certificate of occupancy. So in Cleveland, I mean, it, it takes a long time just to identify a deal, right? So I think Adam was looking for about a year before he came across just basically a junkyard. Like the guy in Cleveland was cleaning out. Um, when Cleveland was really hard hit in the recession, this guy only cleaned up um, uh, foreclosed, boarded up houses. So he'd take them down because people are living out of them, doing drugs and shit. They'd take them down and then they'd take out the foundation and fill the foundation with dirt so it wasn't a hazard and a kid would fall in it, right? Well, this guy would handle all the uh, scrap from a site and he'd bring it to, the, to the, his site and he'd, go through it, copper, steel, you know, concrete, separate it. And he had a huge pile of just like a 35 foot mound of clean fill. Um, and, and besides that, it would be like a junk pile that start to finish the lot looked like shit. Right. <laughs> it looked like something nobody would touch, but here's what everybody missed is lo location in real estate is everything. You could have a Starbucks doing a million um, a, a year and then one, three blocks away that does a half of that, right? Because location is walking distance or wherever it is. So this, this property, just this one that you picked, probably because we've been um, blowing it up recently, is that it has a freeway. Um, I think it's 75, goes over one side and, it, and it's got like a 30 foot overview of it. So it visually looks over the roof lines. So we can do some branding and marketing on top of the site. Um, it's four point, uh, just under four acres. And it has Broadway, which is it feeds a huge industrial area. So you get the guys that do plumbing, electrical, all the all the uh, the trades in the right. area, uh, right there too. And then in addition to that, it's like 15 blocks from Cleveland Indian Stadium. If you go to the Indian Stadium and go to the top, you can literally see our roofs that are going to be copper, shiny, you know, like just eye catching. You know, the, the bright red and the, yeah. the copper and all that, everything you need for self storage, right? When you drive through a town, you see public storage it's bright orange and you're like, you didn't even look at it, but you looked at it, you know, that's how you yeah. catch clientele because the next time you go by, you're like, yeah, no, I know that public storage on 75. Uh, so we found the lot and it was, um, $380,000. Let's say, I can't remember exactly. It was 379 or 389, but the guy that owned it was an excavator. And he's like, Hey, I can clean this site up. I'll get this shit all cleaned up. 
Well, last minute at closing, I'm rewinding in my head as I'm trying to spell the story out. But last minute on closing, um, the guy, like he said, he couldn't clean up the lot and we didn't trust him because he was hard up for cash and we could tell he's like exiting out of here. So we, thought, we said, we, um, it was 380 with it cleaned out. That's what it was with it cleaned up and ready to go. Right. And, and we said, you know, he, he made the mistake of bidding it for almost $80,000 to clean it up, which at the time, one other contractor bid it for 150. So we're like, Oh, it's a, it's a hell of a deal. But after we got close to closing, we didn't trust the contractor and Adam, uh, walked the site with, um, another contractor and the guy's really straight up dude. Like he's just a hustler. He's like, I can clean this place up for 40 grand. I can use the dirt on site. He came in with his backhoe and dug down 10 feet and found nothing but clean fill. So we, at least we knew that the pile didn't have to be trucked out because when you're trucking out dirt, it's 250 a load. I mean, we're yeah. talking hundreds of loads. It would have killed us. So at the last minute, we get the lot for $332,000. And for I don't know if that sounds like a lot or a little to you because it just depends on where you buy land and, you know, and property, no. property density, right? Because now I just – Jawad and I were going back on a, on a lot today in, in south of Dallas – and he's like, it's four bucks a square foot. I'm like, it's 15 acres. That's like 3 million bucks. Like, <laughs> you know, like that's a big, you know, that's a big undertaking because you've got to collect 15 grand in rent before you've even offset your land cost. And that's not even, you know, considering um, building your structures. So I'm, I highly um, am against like front loading debt like that because I didn't get to where I'm at by leading people that way. I lead people by finding the undervalued stuff. So we end up closing the lot for $332,000 because he stripped off his, his fee that he thought he was going to make on it anyway. He was kind of bent on it, but we just said, hey, man, he didn't have the documentation. He didn't have the general liability. The guy was like on his last leg for what he used to do. You, when he, when it, he said he used to be booming when he was cleaning out these houses. He's making a ton of money. He's like, I haven't made shit for two years. <laughs> so we just didn't huh. trust him. And uh, so we went to a new guy, cleaned up, decked the lot, whole lot, has it all graded perfectly. And we have just a little bit of scrap in the back that we're going to take out phase two. But phase one, we're going to build 22,000 net rentable square feet. We get every square foot because we build the first phase to be minimalistic. No office. We do all um, remote management. We put IP cameras up so that they can be remote managed. All the cloud-based software, the gate codes, everything can be ran through my back office through anybody. So, um, you know, VOIPs, we use those in time of days and depending on who's got availability the call lot can go around. So if you call public storage, you press one for do a move in, you don't know where you're calling, right? You never call the end destination site. You call someone that manages and then delegates it out because that's what they're best at, right? Um, and we do the same thing, but we are able to leverage people without a big ass call center, which, you know, public storage runs out of, you know, sooner or later we can get there, but it takes hundreds of sites, right? And that's what we're building up now. So we've got 332 in the lot. Um, we've got 40 to clean it up and get it ready. Uh, with our stormwater pond and now we're going to lay concrete next week and so what are we at right now we closed in february or march um now we're in october november uh you know we've got six seven months into it and now we're finally pouring concrete so it takes time because the city wanted a stormwater management plan um they wanted a grading plan and the, our engineer was from minnesota and he kind of hit some dead ends a few times because i made the mistake of um using him because he doesn't have the inside connections like a local engineer would have. Right. So we, so we, we did get pushed back a little bit on that. We saved about 20 grand in engineering, but we probably lost three months. <laughs> so long story short, we're, we're getting ready to build, um, buildings, the, the, the building materials already shipped. So in three, four weeks, you'll probably see us putting sticks up, um, after the concrete set up and ready to go. And so at that point, it takes about six weeks to set up about 20,000 square feet. Cause they put these buildings up fast. This is like real American labor. This is like not the, the, the kits that you put together. Like these guys bring like the, and they build the trusses by hand. Um, the builder that I'm using for this deal, they're, um, they're bringing them in um, and setting them up in a hotel and everything. Cause they've, they've been building for us for years. Great warranty. I know the guys. So it worked out perfectly to have them, you know, come down there with six, seven guys and knock it out. So um, how many square foot are you going to get on there with the, with, since you lost a little bit to water retention, how many square foot are you going to get on there? Well, we have 22,000 this first, uh, the first phase, all ground level. And then we're going to do a perimeter of drive ups, uh, their mono slope. So you'll drive up to one side in the back. If it snows, it pushes snow up that the back side, um, off the cliff. And I think that on the outdoor drive up, we're going to be just under, uh, just under 40,000 square feet. That's phase two. Phase three is when we get risky. Phase three is when we, um, 
we left a 15, I think it was a 15,000 square foot pad to do a three to four story. There's no limitation on height there. And we can do, um, I'm thinking four story would be the most that we'd ever do. And you see public storage doing it in like South Florida, but the population density, depending on what it does in downtown Cleveland, we can absorb it. But we'll already have the data for the area. We'll know all the call logs. We'll have the idea if it's going to work. Because once you deploy a three story, you're talking about two million, three million, four million, right? right? When, when the first two stories, you might only have, mm, you might only have uh, two million of hard costs into it, but you might already have a six million dollar asset, so four million dollar in equity, right? Because if you got forty thousand square feet and you're doing a buck to a buck and a quarter a month, you're doing anywhere from forty to fifty thousand a month already, okay. and your your overhead costs are hardly anything because of the way we run it. Because we have the back office set up, we use general liability split from from some other sites. It just it depends on each site, but that's where we save all of our costs is that we share the team, right? We share the um, the efficiency that we're building in the back end. So what we've got is in Lytle, we've got four acres. We've got water retention. We, we've actually got seven vacant acres. So mm -hmm. the back three is going to be our water retention. Um, so we shouldn't have to do do any water retention on the four acres. It should be, we should get, get by with that just fine. It's right next to HEB Plus. Um, we're going to build out build it out in phases. We're going to bring you all in. And mm -hmm. when we do this refi, um, we're going to own that land free and clear. Like we nice. won't have any debt on it. So nice. we're hoping we can use land for the down payment because that's some stuff that you talked to me about. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It makes, yeah. Comp, it makes sense to me. You know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. you know, I, well, it's an arm length transaction. When you sell it, you're going to sell it and you're going to deed it over, quick claim it or whatever you're going to do. And you're going to have a sale price that's arm. You know, it's it, they're going to say that you set the price, but you can set it in in the area and say that this was part of my basis is my initial deal and you can you know hedge it over yeah you split the land out to it but you did have an initial injection to buy the whole deal right right so oh yeah you no can doubt. still you can still proof of of cap or, or liquid injection into that deal and i'm sure that the bank with the right projections will will lend us at least 65 to 70 percent maybe more depending on the upside and it depends on how aggressive the bank is right but if we have um history on, on being able to build because that's your biggest risk is the start, construction side, right? Is money leaching through and are you doing GC fees? Are you doing this and that? Is this project feasible? Is it going to collect enough rent to offset its cost, right? These are all the things where once you build with a bank, they know that you're going to fucking use the money, which most people don't understand. They're like, they come in a group with me and they're like, well, when you get to a refinance or when you pull back money, can we just take a hundred grand each? I said, <laughs> do you, do you know what a debt service coverage ratio is and a dis distribution to on K1s, it's like every dollar is tracked on that LLC. And if it's not, then that's that's bad boy carve out, you know, they call it. There's that you're 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 doing things that are are tax or they're they're poor they're cash pouring or are liquidating the asset to so for, so you can do a lifestyle. Because they actually right. it's a it's a lifestyle game, right? Where it's like, okay, now I gotta buy a Lambo so people know I'm doing well. Right. And that's why we right. have so much fun with that is because everybody that uh, thinks that buying these trinket assets is showing that you're doing well is not anything compared to the 10x you get of saying this is the next asset that i have that's doing 50 grand a month not he, costing me three grand and that's how we're doing our that's how we're building out our company nobody's no, i mean we're taking property management because we're we're doing the back end so we're taking mm -hmm. a 10 percent property management but all that goes to employees so it's yep. not even it's not even it's not even an owner draw like i mean i'm still making 1300 dollars a month in my own company and yeah. and something that we pulled from y'all was you know, we don't put hotels on the company. You know what I mean? Like when we have to go somewhere and stay or do <laughs> something, that's all, this that's all the, personal yeah, expenses. You yeah. Know I mean? was, ja I was Jamie. I don't know if you can put another guy on here, but <laughs> the first that when Jamie and I first met, he's like, well, how much do we expense in order else? And, and I'm like, dude, we can't put a dollar on, on the that's real it. estate. And he goes, why? And I go, well, every dollar that we put, I mean, this is when he was fresh, right? Before I was teaching him um, most of the leverage game is that I said every every ten thousand dollars or whatever divide that by 0 0.06 that's your cap rate that you're losing out um, per year I said so if we sent ten thousand on hotels because we're trying to save tax they said you just lost yourself you know a hundred thousand in equity I said that's just not how you do it so that's why we start, we created the holding structure is that um, SSG is a holding company on each one of the uh, properties so we'll disperse cash to SSG, right? And then SSG can use that to travel. And at the end of the day, I don't care if, if my holding company is very profitable because I'm not selling the holding company, right? I break that's off true. the asset. Yeah. So. And, and that's the same way we're doing it. It's yeah. like, it's like, 
you know, GBT's got really bad financials. Um, we're, we're, bi we're biting the bullet for it, but we're also making a bunch. It's kind of like the AC company for y'all. You know, the AC company yeah. makes a lot of money and it's, and it's just borrowing, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of um, the income whenever y'all get ready to borrow something. GBT makes a lot of money flipping houses, selling houses, um, selling contracts, doing stuff like that. And so we buy hotels, we buy the fuel, we do all the, we're the engine behind it. Um, but when it comes time to borrow money, you know, VVC has none of those, those, none of those expenses on the company, you know, and something, I mean, this is all stuff that like, Pat, do we have anybody asking questions, anybody commenting? Like, I, you know, we're, when me and you get to talking, like, this I is honestly, what I, told. Uh, I think you guys are so good. No one knows what the fuck you're talking about, <laughs> including me. So just keep doing what you're doing. Everyone's like, holy shit, massive value. <laughs> <laughs> So just just keep talking. Don't don't worry about them. <laughs> this is I mean, but this is the kind of conversations that, you know, a year ago was French to me. It was like, yeah. I, you know, I couldn't absorb all this. I couldn't take it in. And I know there was a time in your life when it was like that, too, when you were oh, absolutely financials and, and looking over stuff. You're like, what is what is the DS? CR even mean, you know what I mean? Then you're on the internet trying to figure it out. Well, when we started making flow charts, I mean, even Jamie, like he started doing horizontal flow charts and vertical with LLC structures. And he even got me thinking a little bit. I'm like, wait a second, I'm not even at that level. Wait, let me think about this. So him and I like really countered ourselves nicely because he would, he would raise the bar on service businesses because there's a whole different avenue of write-offs and structuring on service businesses, you know, because you get that 179 effect with trucks and buying businesses, goodwill, right? So you can, you can expect a lot of things faster and you need to break that up so you maximize that per LLC. And I mean, the, the amount of data that I learned from him and he learns from me is it, it's the extreme of partnerships where don't ever let someone tell you that a partnership is watering you down because it does nothing but add value. If it's a different or something that you don't know, that you've never met, you've never been in that type of business, partner with that try to understand it, mitigate your risk in the front end, but you're more or less betting on the horse than anything, than the business. Because a service business can work in many, many environments, right? And, they, and it's usually just the horse that screws it up, right? He's either not answering his phone or he's got bad service or he's screwing people over when you're betting on the horse. Right. And that's why I bet on Jamie because I knew that fuck, the, guys, the guy answers the phone at 5 a.m. or 12 p.m. I saw the guy in Attics at 2 a.m. You know? No, I, like, I, was, uh, it was, I was watching the same show. I was watching yeah. the same show at home. I was like, holy shit, look at this guy. Look yeah, at, it was look amazing. At he, look at look yeah. at what he's doing. Look, he he's invented, his... dude. He invented the attic uploads, like the yeah. attic selfies. Are really like, you know, yeah, where he's no. next to an I air mean... handler, and everybody's like, "Whoa!" Like this guy doesn't stop. But that's betting on the horse, right? That's why when when people invest in businesses, it's like everybody knows air conditioning is needed and it's not going anywhere, right? But if you bet on the wrong horse and the guy doesn't doesn't leverage right, or if he doesn't have a good back office, shit slips by if they're not collecting the debt, right? Dude, and, and, and that's one of the things that I've been more impressed with watching his growth is it's like you see the picture where he's got 50 employees in front. You know what I mean? I've got three. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> bro, like what's that? Yeah. Like, just the just the amount of thought it takes to build that structure out where you've got superintendents or, or whatever, whatever y'all call them. Uh, mm -hmm. running, the, running the employees and you're just getting the pertinent information and then yep. you're having to make tough decisions. You know, I've seen a post where you had to let some plumbers go after y'all acquired the plumbing company. Oh, dude, the first day, like we, we knew that the, the uh, culture was wrong. We had to clean house because right. if you have one person in there and they're spending even 10 minutes complaining about the business or change and everybody else is listening to it, think how many hours people are burning, all their energies burned up on, on negativity. So we had to clean house on it. You know, well, every person that bring that Jamie brings in he brings them in because they're going to make money and they're and we're going to make money on the split of having them in house. They got to have value, right? To pay themselves and to pay us. And and really Jamie's all he is is just making sure that everything stays in alignment so that people as employees can trust him and the service is going to get done right. And that's why and, you know, that's why that I taught him is that he he goes, "Well, what is this SBA?" Like he didn't know even know about it. business association and the loan structure, and that's our first deal. So literally within six months of us closing our first deal, we're, we're in DFW and we're already signing loan docs to do a million dollar loan for uh, DFW Heat and AC, right? And that's where it's like, boom, that partnership gave him massive value because I had a bunch of liquidity at the time. He wanted to have a service business with not a lot of assets and used trucks, right? So I proved some liquidity on his behind, on, 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 for his side, and then he proved that he had the resume to do it. He's been doing it AC for 10 years. You get whatever pieces that you have in your life and you put that shit together. That's the only way you're going to run in life. 
you put that shit together with other people that you know that has this other piece that you're missing and you and you join together partnerships are so key you cannot be everything you can't even oh. be 10 percent. you know like you can only be so so much my partner is like we're like yin and yang because he keeps the books and everything else i was on with alan this morning he's talking taxes i'm like bro i hate to tell you but i don't know shit about this like i'm like i mean I, it sounds bad, but that's not my side of the business. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't, yeah. I, like, I barely get my receipts sent in. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. I have no idea. Like, like my deal is I'm, I, I go out and evaluate the property. I get in the contractor's ass, make sure they show up, make sure they do what they're supposed to do. And that's just what we do. Um, and, and, but it works, you know, and then, and then when people come in, it's yeah. like, you're betting on the horse, exactly what you said. You know what I mean? Yep. You're betting on the horse. So people want to partner. Well, you with, you, do, you bet on the guy making the deposit that he doesn't take a split off it. That and that's why when I went into self storage, I removed any when a site self storage site is doing poor. Um, can you guys still hear me? No, we can. I got you. Okay, I said poor connection. I said when it's doing poor, it's because of the manager, and it's because of either that or, or the aesthetics or the location or all three, right? But first thing is you got to remove the manager's power immediately, and then if he if he has any value, you got to make sure that it's slowly brought back in because he could screw up everything, right? He could embezzle, he could he could sell units and take cash on the side. If he doesn't trust you, he's gonna trust himself to make side hustle cash, right? And that's how a lot of this real estate gets dirty is that you have to build the culture from the inside out, right? And, and that's what, you know, I, I preach that all the time. I learn more from the people I'm buying from than a lot of the people that are out there selling education. It, oh, God, look, I, yeah. can, I can look at your mistakes right here. Yeah, while, yeah. You know, you're 60 years old, I can look at where you went wrong. I can see mm -hmm. that fork in the road where you started lifestyle and quit putting <laughs> me on in the roofs. You know what I mean? It's so easy to just get on the lifestyle and then you're on a beach and you're thinking you're killing it. And then you look back and your debt service coverage ratio is one to one. You know, what the fuck happened, right? Because you, all the energy was lost, right? Right. That that you have every avenue packed, you know, that What's people that? are making that they're making a good salary. They're, 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 you know, maybe they're offering them equity splits. Maybe you're offering a buyout sometime later in a service business, right? Where they can take the business and run with it after you, but you've got to get set up that they feel like you're taking care of them, you know? What, and, the, and the thing about a beach is like, everybody likes to be on the beach because they like the beach selfie. Like when you're actually on the beach, you're just, you don't do anything, but make sure everybody else knows you're there. Yeah. You're you just know? sweaty and Sandy. If there isn't girls yeah. in a football game, why the fuck are you even there? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so once you get out of that phase of life, it's like, look, what do I, what do I need to go to a beach for? I need to yeah. take every to the beach. She gets wore out easy. And then we, yeah. and then we get off the beach. We got to go back to work. Um, I was talking with uh, Rome yesterday, the gentleman that came down from Portland. He's talking about vacation. I was like, look, I got, I got a lot of work to do. So vacation for me is, I don't want to be rushed back home. You know what I mean? And until I have the back office to where you can walk away from it and you know you can come back two weeks later and you don't have to run out to Disneyland, rush around the rides, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. your four year old and then rush back home. You know what I mean? I don't want to mm -hmm. I don't want to go to Disneyland. I want to do it whenever everything is right and everything is running good and everything is running yep. smooth. Yep. Unless my DNA is in this business. So it, you know, watching y'all, watching everybody. It was kind of funny whenever whenever me and you started really talking shit to each other on Facebook. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. when, we, when people were like, "Why do you even like that guy?" And I'm like, I know it's so good. Like, why, you, what do you mean? Why do I like him? Yeah. He's so arrogant. He's so cocky. I'm like, have you ever yeah. had a conversation with him? Like, have you ever had a conversation with him? No. Nah. Like this dude. Like when we were at the restaurant in Fort Worth, I don't even know where we were, but whatever wherever that restaurant was, you gave me the best advice on on parenting my daughter. We're both single dads. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Both have that similar background. You gave me the best advice on parenting my daughter of anybody I've ever had that conversation with. And you look at it, you look at Jamie, you look at, you look at what the, the driving force is. It's dads with daughters. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and we've all got that background where, you know, we drank in our twenties, we did things, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Looking back, I don't regret any of it. Uh, you know, it's a time and place time thing. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what I know today. Had I not done that. Now, am I recommending every 21 year old go do what I did? No, get out of it. You know what I mean? We yeah, got, but they didn't have the exposure of the, uh, or not everybody had an iPhone back in 2000, you know, 2002, yeah, no. you know, and yeah. that's, and that's really why the data is becoming so much faster where people are like, you know, that lifestyle is there. I, I was, I was never told that I could become a millionaire in one or two moves. Right. I was yeah. never told that. And now I don't even look at 10 million as that it's a big deal. I look at my, uh, the people in my group making them all millionaires, right? right? And and I used to talk about this, and it would just like it would like to be this sinking, like like I was getting away with something when really you're not. You're pulled down by 
by middle class mentality saying that that's not possible. And you should right. be you should be very very happy for where you're at, and you should not go anymore because there's all that fear on the other side, which really that's all they're selling you is something to stop because they haven't started yet and they haven't found out what they truly want to chase, right? So it becomes very easy to be pulled down. And that's what and and, and look guys, if y'all are liking this, share it, whatever. Look, Dalton, our high school kid, you know what I mean? He's 18. When I first meet him, he's he's going to college. He's going to join the Navy. He's doing all these different things. Now, he's negotiating owner finance transactions. He don't even know what interest rate is. But yeah. he picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad off my desk or Jacob's desk, mm -hmm. somebody's desk around the, around the office, started reading it. And now he's making owner finance offers. And literally, in his spare time, texting me, he's like, I got this guy. He's going to owner finance 5000 down, 12% interest. I'm like, nah, bro, 6% interest. Yeah. And he's, you know, and I mean, he's just hammering away. But He's at 18. You know what I mean? When he realizes Unbelievable how potential. this is, he'll, yeah. he'll knock out probably 60 grand on his first move and it'll change yeah. his life. He'll go buy a jet ski, no doubt. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like he'll go buy, but then he'll come back. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, look, that was great. But what if you could have took that 60 grand and made you may it pay you $600 a month? Your jet ski payment would have only been 250. You yeah. still had 400 for gas. You know what I mean? Like, well, I'd say it's reverse leverage. Yeah. I mean, where are you going to place it? And, you know, who, where are you going to? It's, it's after tax utilization. What are you going to do with it? Does it really right. solve your problems or does it make you feel better? No. I mean, the only reason you see me buy stuff is because it immediately chunks out or carves out some of my tax that's coming up, right? Like the trucks, the snow oh, plows, yeah. this and that, you know, I immediately have a, a place to deploy it. Like even the first class tickets, you know, when I pay $600, $700 for a ticket, it's only costing me 450, right? Everything, oh, yeah. everything that I, uh, hold on. Can you, do you still have me? Yeah, we still got you. Oh, I want it. Everything that I um, that I spend, I look at as fifty five or fifty fifty percent or you know fifty three percent utilization because my federal tax, anything over most people aren't doing this math, but anything over a quarter million in income, even after you do accelerated depreciation, holding companies and all this shit, and you knock down a few million dollars in uh, a few million in, in annual income down to two hundred fifty, everything after two fifty is it's fifty percent tax. So if you don't use it to expand your business. The government takes it, right? Fifty percent of it. But, but I mean, you guys don't have it in Texas, but in in Minnesota, you know, you got your federal at thirty-seven, right? Thirty-seven, thirty-eight, or whatever it is. And my state's at at nine point eight percent after a quarter million dollars. So right. I'm I'm. It's highly advantageous for me to redeploy it to the to the people that I trust and the assets that I know to multiply it again, right? That's and exactly then, right. And, yep. And that's why you hear people talking about tax. And you're like, you're not either sophisticated enough or you haven't done the math or you don't even have a CPA. You're doing, you're doing TurboTax or something, you know, like they don't have no clue is that the sophistication of really setting up a holding structure in the back office, employees, if you don't want to pay much tax, give your, give your um, employee a, a commission bonus at the end of the year and, you know, start knocking away at stuff so you can motivate people to make more equity, right? That's so if you, hire, if you hire a district manager and he increases NOI across the board, 200K, you might have paid that district manager 60, 70,000, but he just made you a couple million. million dollars in equity. Oh yeah, yeah. two million yeah. at a 10 cap. I mean, yeah. but at a six cap, you know, it's what, three million. I mean, it's something yeah, stupid. Yeah. It's, so, it's, so, stupid. It's a stupid multiplier, which that's where, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, if you keep them away from lifestyle and keep them multiplying that, a million is not the destination. 10 million isn't the destination. You know, it's tens of millions where you can, step back a little bit, take that Disneyland trip and say, calls are forwarded for three days or whatever, you know, right. but you're still the leader because if something happens, it's still hitting your inbox, your email. We need you, you know? That's it. But, uh, and, and look, this, I grew up in Grosbeck. So we, we, we call it running it like a ranch. Like, you know, you ask any rancher around here, what he wants to do? And he'll say, oh, if I could just make this ranch, make any money, that ranch yeah. is making money. You just ain't paying no taxes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they're writing off everything because everything in a ranch is tax deductible. I mean, yeah. everything. Yeah. Top of yeah, you can break so, even for a decade. And that's where that's exactly where my my uh, the mindset of my parents were is that, oh, well, we, sh we should take cash in and then not show that. I said, how are we going to maintain a debt service coverage ratio? You know, like yeah. they're like, well, what is that? You know, so I brought my dad out of construction uh, for over 40 years. He immediately went in after high school. You know, it's a smaller town, Bismarck, North Dakota. And he was construction manager. He, he worked himself up to the foreman, like top guy in the, in the area, but he would never break, you know, a hundred and some thousand a year. And I, I doubled that the first two years that we started investing, you know? So he really, um, 
he really saw the value in being able to set his own hours. And then, you know, you work late and you feel, oh, this is great. I work late for myself. Like you don't even count it, you know, versus yeah. being like, oh, I worked late for the man again, you know. But if, you, if you're in the right group and, and, you, and, you, and you're sharing opportunity right, where it's not like this glass ceiling, no one ever feels like um, they're being, um, you know, overutilized or, 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 not, or not feeling their, their full potential. That's right. And, and see, so we're setting it up. I mean, I don't know, like we're, we're, we feed our, our tax account first, our reserve account second, and then, mm-hmm. you know, owner takes, take, I think we're about to start taking dividends. Uh, like I think it's going to be paid quarterly owner draws um, mm-hmm. the next quarter, but you know, it's something that, that it's a path that we're forging that I feel like you're forging a different path, but the same path. I mean, you're, you're mm-hmm. growing rapidly partnerships um getting in a lot of different oh we're dumping i mean we're see i don't need jamie has a really good air conditioning base i have passive income from him we decided that you know after we made just an ssg off off a few like two or three sites we're we're like looking at a cash flow of like eight hundred thousand. like this is insane right but we're like but how insane would it be if we redeploy every dollar of that and that's where you see the the 10 sites right co-equity 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 but then we bring in mastermind 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 how much human talent did we bring with that little bit of, of money that we put on the table? Yeah, we're still going to have to pay our tax base, but it's small because we have um, our, our hold coat then goes, passes back to what we call like JRW and DHV, which is our final destination. Um, uh, that's our final destination LLC, which I'll put 2.5% um, and it'll feed off all my hold codes, which feed off all the sites, right? but I'll put 2.5% to my dad and my mom because if something happens to me, I want to make sure my daughter's taken care of, right? And that's they've right. already got access to that. So um, the, the trickle-down effect is like, that's what I was going back to is that SSG, I want to just crush all that. I don't need that income. What am I going to do with it? I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't change my life. All I got to do is pay rent because I, I, don't, I don't buy houses. I don't live a lifestyle. And the trucks and everything else is paid through the LLCs of the Hold Co. that services that industry or that, or that area. And everything else, it's like that's that's house money to go back and to redeploy. And then the only thing you're really worried about is these, uh, you know, quarterly or our uh, uh, tax. You know, you gotta you gotta ma- mitigate those coming up. I just paid a hundred grand like the other day, but it's just part of the game, right? You're trying to get no, it down as low as you can, and then push it back as far as you can. And that you'll see a lot of um, uh, middle class mindset is that they're like, oh, you can't afford your taxes. Like, no, I've got better use of the tax that I didn't pay yet, right? Right. So if it's a hundred grand. I can do a, a contract for deed, hold something, and then cash out, refinance, and then pay my tax. But I just got another asset right before. So there's right. always a way to redeploy. And, and, and that's and what then we once do you too. Have, yep. it, it's, 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 it's a probably the most interesting thing I've ever dove into. Um, you know, some of this stuff that, that the people hear you talking about, and they're like, man, is that even legal? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I remember, I remember, I remember yeah. that, that conversation whenever you were talking about that very thing right there, like, yeah. You know, your taxes till October 15th or, you know, yep. Yep. An extension yeah, it cost me oh. for like $86,000. It cost me like, um, I don't know what it was like 4,500. Yeah. So, you know, three, three, 4%. That's nothing. Right. And, uh, but you got to, but, but you can leverage a whole uh, another million dollar asset with that, yep. that money hold yep. it that much longer. And then, you know, anyways, it's, it's, it's a game and, and it's a, it's, a beautiful game. Like it's like literally whenever you start looking at it and you start thinking about it, you know, whenever I'm looking at cost segregation and I'm looking at, you know, accelerated depreciation and everything Mm -hmm. that you can do, it's like, man, this is, this is set up to where you can show a loss, like literally show a loss. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's no, there's no problem with showing a loss. And if you keep most of your liquidity inside of your LLCs and your hold group, you become up, you become a very strong network because now you're not passing it to your personal and being like, Oh, we need to pay tax or whatever, you know, retain as much as you can trickle it down live on the least amount and then you end up redeploying that much faster because See. now the you're not doing a capital call with three partners saying hey we should go back into this move or whatever it's already sitting there because not every everybody thinks of that shared account as their redeploy capital not it doesn't have to hit personal right i had a, you know it took a lot of time with even my dad he's like when do we start paying each other i'm like does it even matter i said the asset value is there the the, um, the the money's in the holding company. The money can be redeployed into assets and new partnerships. And then all of a sudden, now we just you know we rip out like ten or fifteen thousand per hold co, and it just uh, and then it just builds up, you know. And and that's the way to do it because now you're not cash pouring and 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 coming to a point where you're like scrabbling for 
property tax or, you know, or whatever it is, or a new acquisition yeah. where you always got floating money. So, I mean, organization wide, you end up with all these assets that have a couple million liquid, but then personally you hold 25,000, right? That's then, it. Most people call me poor. They'd be like, oh, you're poor. You only have 25,000. I'm it. like, yeah, I'm like, you're right. Because you can't see me behind a PFS. That, and you know what? I mean, I'm if the someone, exact same way. Like, like someone sues like, me, if someone sues me, like, what are you going to go after? My rented house? I mean, yeah, I've got four houses that are rented out underneath an LLC now. I used to personally own them, and they do have some um, some personal HELOCs on them that don't expire for like five years. But they none of that stuff is in, in my name anymore. Everything is in under an LLC split up so that I'm ultimately protected. It's like, how do you get a $20 million net worth with 25,000 cash, right? That should be the next status update, is that you <laughs> diversify all of your assets to keep all the liquidity away from your, your personal side because you're not, all you care about is cash flow. To live, it. it's, it's, yeah, it's inconvenient to live. You have to, you have to pay your bills, right? But do you need more money in that in your personal? Because what, do you, what, what, what LLC is your personal? You don't use your, your personal name to acquire. You use your businesses to acquire. That, that's exactly right. The house I live in, I was living in my RV. The house I live in, my partner moved in the street and the, his neighbors are going to put up a fence and try to block him out of his house and it was going to go to court. And he's like, I'm not going to court with you. How much do you want for your house? Or like 130. He's like, get the hell out of my way. <laughs> so it was GPT Investments. He's like, Corey, you want to move into a house? I'm like, yeah, I'll move in. So I move in. I don't, I don't, I don't have anything. So I take a bed and two couches out of a house that we bought that was somebody else's trash. I buy a new mattress and boom, that's it. I'm, I'm living, I'm living in a house again. I don't even have a dinner table. You know what I mean? So it's, oh, yeah. and then, and then, uh, and then when people come down to visit me, they're like, bro, this is how you live. I'm like, I don't live here. I sleep here. Y'all don't understand. Like, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to put more furniture into our new apartment complex while we're remodeling it than I'm going to have in my personal house. Cause it's like, I'm going to rent that unit fully furnished. Uh, this is pre-tax furniture. You know what I mean? And this, and this is, this is the mindset game of, of, you know, I buy three thousand dollars worth of furniture. I can rent the rent the house for two hundred dollars, or rent the apartment for two hundred dollars a month more. You know what I mean? It's a cash. It's a cash flow game. You're playing your personal life like a business. You know? Yes. And and, that, and that's where the inconvenience kind of drops out because you're able to to mitigate. My phone was dying. I had to move it. I didn't plug but, in. Yeah. But that's that's where we we as entrepreneurs we look at everything as a business. So right now, um, I'm sitting in a house. I don't even know how to turn this camera around. But um, let's see. Oh, that's a screenshot. So we can see there. We can see it. Oh, oh yeah. So this this house is on a lake. You can see the boat dock back here. But it's um it's 6,200 square feet. It's um it's worth about uh, 1.5. The property tax insurance because everything is ran like a, a business, right? I look at it before I rent it. The property tax insurance are 30,000 a year. My rent cost fully in is um 60 it was 6500 the first year and i think it went to 67 so i'm i'm only paying for them to hold the nut and the bag like what three four thousand dollars a month right to live in this this lake house so i get the experience of my daughter to be able to go on the lake to have a jet ski or whatever you know laying around or and then we can do an ice skating rink back here but it's again it's ran like a business because um it's a personal choice to say i'm not ready to take a million and a half dollar or a million and a half um, house risk and there's really no value and that's where we go back and forth with the ryan stuman approach is that no the best money is made into to own where you live because all your payments go towards equity which no they equity, don't it, yeah with, with equity in a house is all speculated because it's wear and tear my dog you know it's dog hair whatever scratches the floor like that all all that stuff is depreciation which, where you get that on um a pnl when you have a property you have a trailer report you get 6% of that to rehab and repave and to fix, you know, water, septic or whatever the right. case comes up because that's on your P&L. But you don't get that on your own house. That's that's the, just your own blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> and, and the thing about it, like what he says is, is completely false anyways, because a mortgage doesn't flip until 10 years. You know what I mean? Right. You're not paying more, more, more principal than interest, interest until 10, until well, you owe, the, owe 10 30, years on a mortgage. Yeah, when the 30 year note came out. Most people didn't realize that housing value went up because of the affordability, right? If you right. look back 20 years, you didn't you didn't see many notes over 15 years, right? Right. And all of a sudden, notes went to 20, 25, 30. I I shit you not, they will go to 35, 40 years, right? Because that's how that's how you pour um, that's how you pour capital into, and, and that's how you pour net worth and consumer consumer happiness as you build equity in their house, right? Now we're, we're taking a HELOC. Now we're going to go put more stuff on credit cards and we're going to go on a trip. Yep. So that, that's really, you know, 
most people aren't keeping an eye on that. And that's where most of the, uh, the balls are moving in, in the court for the home equities. But if you get caught in the wrong time, it's just all speculated. It just all disappears, you know? Over not. Pat, Over we not. got any questions? That's like, uh, nobody knows. Corey's a, Corey's a really big Ryan Stuman fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know if our viewers know that big fan of the hardcore closer, big fan. <laughs> that's yeah. a joke by the way. So uh, yeah, that's all I got. You guys continue well, doing it. I think what you're doing I think is we, phenomenal. I mean, the most Dave. thing is that we use Ryan Stuman is it's a big learning tool for the, for the community because it's the exact opposite of how wealth is actually built. So he has the toys, he has the house, he's chasing everything that has a cash poor effect on your life, which I did that as an engineer. And I learned that even if I invested all my money into 401ks and I paid down my house and if I did everything available to Dave Ramsey mindset that I would not have a million dollar net worth by the time I was 50. That wasn't good enough for me. You know, well, I said, that's just not it. You know, you know, Ryan's big beef is with, with Grant Cardone. He, I don't know if he actually believes what he says or he just wants to go opposite side of Grant Cardone. You know what let, I mean? Let me flip my hat around real quick. Oh. <laughs> so, so he just wants <laughs> He just wants to be he just wants to be on the opposite side of Grant. That's that's, you know, because whenever you watch him break down the numbers, you 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 know that you know, you know that he's just not a numbers guy. It's just not not realistic. He is a flashy nice guy. I mean, he's a nice guy, but I mean, it, you know, I've met him in person. He's, he's just, cool. he, he, he needs the flash. He needs the sizzle so he can sell the steak. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, if you don't have the P and L, you got to have the flashy car, right? That's it. So it's so, one or the other. And that's, and that's really it, you know? And it's like, look, if I had something to sell, I'd probably, I'd probably dress a little better. I'd probably, you know, there's probably a lot of stuff I'd do different, but I don't have anything to sell. You know what I mean? Only thing I want to do is go find my next deal, go find my next equity play. You know, we raised rent three hundred dollars a month and added eight hundred thousand dollars in net worth in thirty yeah. days. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's wild. So, mm. so that's that's what I want to do. You know what you I mean? Know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna probably set you up with in the next six months. We're gonna go to a lot of um, life insurance um, type of money where they want ten year ten year um, interest only notes where they don't even want to manage the principal because it's it's a nuisance to them, right? They want to make sure that the interest is paid. Uh, the, the investors on life insurance, just like I have a life insurance policy, I put a hundred thousand into it. It's worth twelve million dollars day one, right? So if something right. happens to me, everybody's taken care of. My legacy continues. Most people don't understand that, but within seven years, you get full leverage out of that money, that cash asset value, right? So within seven years, I can take a loan against my own life insurance policy at five percent. So did that money really dissipate? No, it has a holding cost at prime rate, right? But that life insurance money is collecting faster than you believe <laughs> because every a lot of wealthy people want to pack it into something that's making interest, right? It has a, it has a, a fair market value, cash value, it's, and it needs to be invested. It needs to make 3 to 5% at minimum. So I'm getting offers at 70% LTV, non-recourse, um, where you just – the only reason they'd ever come by you if, is if you cook the books. If you cook the books and said that – you were netting 300K and you were running 200. Now you have a PG. They'll sue you. Right. But any, yeah. anything else, it's like if you're running a real business and you're making money, they'll write you checks for three to $5 million at 70% LTV. You build up a nice portfolio. I mean, obviously it has to be like big parcel stuff, you know, like a 50,000 square foot storage facility or a 50 unit apartment building or, you know, something like awesome good, you know, like 90 um, uh, townhome development, right? right. Where you can where you can just drop an egg, 10 years interest only. Everybody's like, well, you're not paying any principal down. But if you're an elitist mindset, all that principal that you would have put down, you put that back into the property and rehab it and expand it, right? And you make the so, service even better. So in, in 10 years, if you haven't chased inflation, which in 10 years at 3% interest, you should be capturing 30% equity nearly with inflation, right? The smallest loan or the largest loan you'll ever have is day one, right? That's it. Because- and in 10 years, a $5 million loan that I take out today is going to be like, man, that's a small loan. That is a small loan because, because your money's worth less. Your and that's money's worth less and, and your assets worth more, you're cash flowing more. So yeah. then you have zero risk when, when you're at 30 to 40% LTV and someone's like, hey, I want to take out your debt. Okay, now I went to $7 million. You know, I, right. when, my, when I first met my banker in South Florida, I met this guy named Ronnie through my banker and I met up and he said he says cash flowing like personally um, 300000 
dollars um, a month. And he was, he was just a, a normal guy just buying commercial real estate back and forth. And my banker goes, yeah, but you know, he's got a $7 million loan on a building he bought in 1970. I go, sounds smart to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, For no. him, the banker's like, that's a lot of debt. And then I'm like, dude, his cash flow is 300,000 a month. I mean, yeah. I think, I think he's doing pretty good. No, yeah. he's not, he's not hurting at all. Like, yeah. and, and that's the, that's the thing that I try to explain to people every day. I'm like, look, you know, if I take out a hundred thousand dollar loan today and I still owe 80 on it 10 years from now, hundred thousand dollars might not buy you a candy bar in 10 years. You know what yeah. I mean? So, okay. so it's, it's like, it's not going to be, it's not going to, you, you've seen a few deflationary times, but there was not as much, the data was not as fast. So in the twenties, you know, in the thirties where there was some deflationary that I think it, the economy dropped 20, 30%. Can that happen again? I don't fucking know. But uh, the, the data says that it's going to happen faster because the 2001 and the 2008 recession, look how much shorter it was, right? 2008 recession or the six and seven recession. If you go back and you had it looked at it in hindsight, you're like, shit, I wouldn't have sold anything. That was short. I would only no. have to pay in for, for 15 months, you know? It's, a, it's then, a hockey stick. It's I mean, a hockey stick. Yeah, exactly. And then you would have just captured all the low interest. You'd have been fine. And the only people that got bit were the ones that were taking private capital money and they were trying to pull back the deeds because they didn't know what to do, right? And the guys that have loans that were fully AM loans like I'm getting are 10 years are minimum, right? Where they just relock or reprice, but you don't need a new appraisal at five years. You can't really get stuck in that five-year mark, right? I mean- But I feel, I feel pretty safe about it because I'm like, I don't think banks want to own mobile home parks. You know? Dude, and then not only that- like you, but Call, call my sure. loan, go down there and deal with them. You know yeah, what I mean? You don't like, want to sell it either. But whatever bank you use, max them out personally- because now you became a partner in the bank. Oh, the yeah. bank I, already, I already said to the bank, I go, well, you know, everything I have here is based off of what I've refinanced and what I have in e earned equity with appraisals. I said, what are you going to do to me if, if um, there is a recession? And he actually brought it up. And I said, he goes, well, we probably go to interest only and make sure because he can't recreate me. I'm David right. and I have 15 um, sites in the metro area. I'd rather keep, he has to recreate me out of recession, right? That's he has it. to find someone that's willing to, run all that real estate or he keeps the guy that knows it best safe. So he That's does it. interest only. He does some deferred payments. Maybe he makes me sell off one investment and pay some deeds on the other ones. But there, that's what Donald Trump did. You know, when the times got tough, he had to sell a few assets, liquidate, reorganize, and you keep majority of your net worth. So even if my net worth drops 30% for a year, year and a half, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to no. buy any shirts every day, but I'm not going to panic. I wouldn't. No, I'm not. I, I'm look. Our our stuff's in more demand during a recession, anyways. Oh, I, it's, I like, it. it's like it's like what what you know. If go ahead, knock six hundred and fifty dollar a month rent off the map during a recession. Good luck. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck. Good well, luck. That, I don't I don't, the, I don't know what to tell you. Like, so you got a storage locker and it's and it's a one car garage, and you're paying two hundred bucks a month in Florida. Or you're paying a hundred bucks in Texas, right? Where are you gonna put your shit? When you get kicked out of your four thousand square foot house, that's it. A one car drive. Storage yard. Yeah, that's it. You're gonna have and to then, move. And then, and then people will judge and they'll say, "Well, you do self storage." I'm like, if I didn't do what I did, they'd lose everything. So, yeah. so I if know I, people that have had their stuff in storage for years yeah. and they pay the bill. It's on autopilot. They don't even know. There's so, people that use storage right, and there's people that use it wrong. But without storage, what are, what's your what's your option? Nothing. You gotta go put put it in grandma's garage. She doesn't want it in there. You know? No, and, and 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 the build cost is so low. It's like, look, yeah. the it, it's it's when I look at when I looked at the hard cost of building a um, an apartment or something like that, and it's like 105, 110 dollars a square foot, and I'm like, okay, you know what I mean? Then you look yeah. at storage, and it's like worst case scenario, 25. You know, like, okay, a dollar a square foot, um, a dollar a square foot. Which one am I going to invest in? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, which yeah. One? Right. but it's but the back office is so much more sophisticated on uh, storage because it multiplies so fast. Because right, like your, oh, like yeah. your guy that had, um, oh, hold on, your guy that had 1,200 units, right? He could probably feel the burn already because I did the first. My dad still lived in North Dakota. My parents and, everybody, and I did it all myself for the first um, year. I think about a year. I, yeah, I had to I had to get my dad's income like almost double from what he was making and in his uh, in a construction gig. And then he finally moved over because I was against the wall. I had one administrator and she was like working like 25, 30 hours a week. And besides that, it was just me. And I was just like, no matter where I was at, a closing or if I was um, putting up a new LED light, an external light, around, I was at state storage, you know, like in the grassroots, I was like doing voice over 
recorded um, uh, uh, contracts. And then I emailed them the contract later and I'd move them into the unit all out of my phone as fast as I could. And, and I, I knew that once I knew it was there, I'm like, all right, I can do this from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And if it's going to get me, my family and some partners and elite people around me, I'm going to keep doing this. Right. Because that's it. And, that, that's it. And, and the best part about that is like, at least for me, I'm like, man, we should have hired sooner. You know what I mean? Yeah. Every employee oh, who has made us more I money. Know. But you know it's, what I mean? you gotta be, it, it becomes like such a, a mental break to be able to, to um, break a part off of what you initially built. You, it, there's so much ego behind it where you're like, no one else will do it as good. But it's your job to make that next person as good or better. And that, that's, that's it. Yeah, I had a hard time. Part. We're closing on a mobile home park this week. It's owner finance. It's got a $91,000 in allow. We're buying it for $300,000, putting $50,000 down on it. Cash on cash is in the months. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but. The funny thing about that deal is like somebody's like, what, you know, what is that? And I said, that's Diana. That's our, that's our bookkeeper. <laughs> like that's her salary right there. Damn like, right. We hired, we hired Diana. We bought this. Now, now the, the park is servicing Diana. Now that uh, entire part of the puzzle is taken care of. And you put that chip down and, say, and then you go to the that's next it. one. Yeah. Yeah. And then her, you don't have to have no, handle those conversations anymore. It's just like Jamie, I can't even get him on the phone anymore without texting me. Like call me because every one of his calls, goes to an administration so she can filter them and figure out where it goes, you know, that's so, cause we know where our time is best utilized, you know, and that's where, and that's where you grow your influence, you grow your team and then everybody dominates together. Well, dude, I appreciate your time. I don't know if, I don't know if Pat's got any questions for us. If anybody popped up, any, anybody, any uh, we did out? have a couple questions. Let me scroll back through. We had one that was really good. Um, it says, um, I'm scrolling back through. There was a lot of them. Okay. So it was Andrew. What is the long-term play to remove that hard work and dollars as you beat the tax game now via reinvesting in people, systems, and properties slash projects? Does that make sense or you want me to repeat it? So he thinks that the tax is going to catch up at some point. That's what is it that sounds like. Yeah. yeah. So at some point you are going to pay more tax, but that's your, that's your choice to, to, to stop growing. Right now you have a $3 million personal cash flow or something like that. Right. Well, you got to pay the tax at some point. Yes, I agree. But how, if how on a, on a percentage basis, how much does that tax affect you when you have a $3 million, $4 million, $5 million personal cash flow? It's trivial at that point. Right. Cause now you're netting after tax a million five to 2 million bucks. Right. But right now, if you pay all that tax up front, all your growth is cut out. Everything that you should be thinking about in the beginning is growth. Redeploy, 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 push forward, push forward. Because in five years when, yeah, we're not buying trucks anymore, we're not buying or we're not doing cost eggs or everything else catches up. Well, let's say a cost egg runs out. You're in your seventh year or five year or whatever you get away with. Um, guess what your next tool is? 1031, right? That's you're it. Gonna, you, you're going to 1031 that investment. You know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna know that ball is moving because you're going to have a CPA and accountant saying, you're running out of time here. You got a ticking time bomb. This asset's got two years left on it. But guess what? Worst case scenario, you hold on to that asset for another year. You don't get depreciation. Well, now you just put interest only financing on it. So you're not paying down um, uh, principal, right? Because that's where that's what you're fighting against, right? Because when you're paying down principal, that's not cash flow, it's the bank's money, right? But if you do interest only, then you don't need to be protected from that once you get a low, a low enough LTV, right? So if you got 50% LTV, Ta the, the interest that you pay on your debt is 100% tax deductible, right? At some point, you have to pay your tax. Is it a big deal? No, it's a percentage, right? But it's a it's a lot more affecting you in the beginning than it is at the end of the game. Here's the thing about a 1031 exchange, too. Just learned this. i um, watching somebody do one. You 1031 exchange into another property, um, and let's say you own that property free and clear. Uh, day two, you can go borrow the money against it tax-free. So Damn right. Yeah, it's it's a you just can't have that conversation with the bank before yeah. the 1031. You can't go like talk to the bank um and say, Hey, are you gonna loan me money against this asset? You can't do any underwriting. The bank can't know about it, yada yada yada. Yeah. But yeah, you get know. the deed and then refinance and leverage the deed, get the appraisal. And you can yeah. even wait three months to do your rehab plan. It's because just like Grant Cardone's deals in the 30 millions, every time he's like, Oh, I'm gonna turn this tennis court into a pool, right? Well, now he just added on hundred bucks per unit, right? You've collected $5 million in equity. You think that he's not going to leverage that thing with insurance money or some interest only, you know, he gets capital just like all the other big boys is that interest only. Okay. Well, let's put it at 70% LTV. All that capital is re back in his account, redeploy. 
That's it. There's always and, there, in the, the 1031. People think that this is not legal or whatever. You know, the 1031 is only there for one reason: to make us worker bees, right? That's it. To, that's to it. keep the money to keep the money moving to keep. If the, you if you held your your five million dollars in assets, and then you never had a 1031 available to you, you would you wouldn't want to sell and 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 up your game, right? Because you can put it right behind leverage again and, and go again. And if that 1031's not there, oh, the shit would hit the fan. That'd be like taking out your tax deduction on a um, on your single family, right? You say you take ten thousand dollars a year in interest on your single family. And they, they're like, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. Right? They already lowered it from a million to seven fifty, I think. I don't know, uh, but I, um, that's already lowering the av- how advantageous it is for people to buy because they're like, that's their biggest thing. They're like, yeah, but I can write off the interest, a hundred or ten thousand in interest on your house is saving you three thousand dollars in tax. Is that worth taking a half million dollar risk to maintain no. it? Not at all. Yeah, Andrew's no. actually still on here and said thank you. That's actually exactly what he was aiming for. So. Cool. Appreciate that, who guys. Else, who else, Pat? Who, who else got something? Um, Cody says this is mind blowing. <laughs> um, bunch of people are going to come back and watch some replays. A lot of people stayed with us. Um, that's, awesome. that's pretty much it because I I did reset my phone a couple times to get comments and I was jumping back and forth. But uh, yeah, man, you guys, it was awesome. Dude, appreciate guys, it, guys. Like. Where, where, where do they need to go, Pat? Where do they find us at? We're on all these other other places. So where they can... uh, I record all the audio now and I extract the audio. So you can find us on Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and of course, Apple iTunes podcasts. Once we're done here, I'll export all the audio and I'll load it all up. We did have a couple uh, audio connection things, but it still went. So I'll go back and edit it the best I can. But with a mobile connection, we, at least we can access anyone. Um, which is awesome. So we appreciate you being on, Dave. Thank you so Dude, much. And where can they find you, Dave? Where, where, if people want to give, partner, give the people or they your got links. money, they want give to deploy. Give the people your links. Yeah, where, where, where can they find <laughs> well, you? You can reach us on, on statestoragegroup.com. Uh, there's a link that uh, about us. There's a 1-800 number. You can leave a voicemail. Maybe you got a property that you're you're looking at. Does it make sense? Uh, you know, we got underwriters that go through it and, t- and take a look at the deal. A lot of people reach out through um, Facebook Messenger, which I got a guy that's trying to dig through it right now. There's just a <laughs> lot of stuff there, man. It's, it gives me anxiety opening up that thing because I want to be um, purpose driven, but I don't want people just to send me garbage because they, they get they get they the chills. They're like, they, you know, it's hard because you want to respect people, but they'll just send you garbage too, you know, just to see if, right. if is this deal good? It's like, you know, you got to put the time and money into it or you don't get the respect. So if you're going to send something to my inbox, be very thorough. Um, you know, well analyzed, do occupancy checks in the area, price per square foot for land, you know, zoning, setbacks, wetland, you know, all the stuff that, that you want to put into it because I don't have time to analyze Dude, a thousand wheels. Put it in y'all's group, the anti-guru group. Yeah, and, the anti-guru and tag, group. and tag you in it and you'll get hit by 40 yeah. answers from the best in the business. And then you might even see a couple get into a lock horns and argue over what the best thing is. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> oh, well, yeah, that's, that's where we learned. I mean, think about how much we learned just reading comments. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. Shit. Do I jump in on this fight? I don't know. I <laughs> seem like they know their shit. Like I mean, online, online marketers were taking a beating for a good year and a half. It was pretty fun. <laughs> like, so yeah, but, but before they made Bitcoin, uh, where it couldn't be on Facebook no more. Hey, if, if Bitcoin no, wasn't here, yeah. I don't even know. Like, dude, if I was just this boring guy that did storage and cash and cash returns, and I didn't make fun of Bitcoin and marketers and Lambos. I would have like two views. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta still talk. Dude, no you gotta one's gonna start. listen. You know, like no one cares. You, you have to, you have to make a little bit of commotion. And you gotta stir the pot. You gotta, you gotta make people think because if they just take the easy road, they just live a life in a washing machine, right? Go to work, come home. Go to work, come home. What else is out there? Who else can I help? Who else can I, can I build around me? It's not a bad thing to build, a, a, like just an elite mindset around you where everybody on your team is very intelligent or knows more than you. Do. That's not a bad thing. And that's dude, I'm going in a mastermind. I'm, yeah. I, I got invited to an invite only mastermind by a dude that's got 30 years in the business and it's costing me 12 grand, but I'm, I'm getting in there. It's, they meet four times a year. Um, there's only 40. It's, they're from all over the nation. They move it around the nation. And when yeah. I get in, I'm inviting my people. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, because I it. it's like, it's like, look, if you can get around somebody that's already forged the path or they can give you that one thing, how long does it take to make back 12 grand? You know what I mean? No. Like, that's that's the way I look at it. Like if I go to the first one and it's all Bitcoin guys, then I'll, I'll be like, okay, well I'll write it off. You know what I mean? But otherwise, <laughs> get that one gold nugget. You know what I mean? No, Jamie's paid twenty thousand for a sales guy, 
to come in and say, you know, this is how you come in and this is how you take care of a customer and make sure that A to Z, they have everything they need for their, so that they don't have to call us again if the heating season's coming up or cooling or how to close right. a sale. And within um, the end of the day, they made that money back. You know? That's it. That's that's the way I look at it. If you've got if you've got good people that know what they're doing, I don't mind paying anybody. It's the guys that are that you know like post me a HUD, show me something. You just you just yeah. gave a bunch of good theory. Now, yeah, the yeah. No HUD gurus, we're calling you out. <laughs> so yeah, that's the best. Dave. Uh, y'all give Dave a follow, a like, and then um, you know find us on iTunes. That's what I look at. So. Anyways, I appreciate it, Dave. Thanks for your time. I'm going to go eat my steak. Uh, Same here. I, I can't wait to see you again. Pat, hang up on us, bro. Here, I'm going to cue in the song. You guys can hang up on me. I'm cueing in the song, baby. I'm He's the motherfucker of mobile homes. He's the motherfucker. Hope everybody enjoyed it. We'll see you guys next time. I will upload all the audio to the podcast sites. We love you. Thanks for the support.